there are uh, occasions where um, I'll read a book and just want to read everything that that author's ever written, but that I never would have found that book or that author uh, without some chance happening. And for Christmas a couple of years ago, a friend of mine uh, who was a professor was offered in, in payment for doing a review for um, Oxford University Press was offered um, uh, either a cash honorarium or um, a ticket basically for a bunch of free books from uh, their press. And as a very, very, very generous uh, Christmas present to me, uh, he decided to give me the books. He, he, anything from Oxford University Press that I wanted um, was mine. And he ended up uh, getting me like eight or ten books. And one of them was a book that I'll review very, very soon um, called Fallen Soldiers reshaping the memory of the world war uh, by a man named George L. Moss. This book is also by George L. Moss. It's not Fallen Soldiers, but this is the second book that I've read by Moss, and it's very close to being just as impressive as the first one, which I was truly blown away by. Uh, this book is uh, called Confronting the Nation, Jewish and Western Nationalism by George L. Moss. Um, in Fallen Soldiers, Moss talks about what he calls the cult of the fallen soldier, which pops up right around World War I, and the emergent European nationalisms of the 19th century and the impacts these had on the cultural experience of war. This book which was written three years later in 1993, uh, continues his discussion of the different kinds of nationalism in Europe with a slight focus on Zionism in the last third of the book. While there are continuous concerns that are picked up and examined throughout, this reads more like 12 related essays than it does a tightly unified book uh, that I thought I was getting when I bought it in Half Price Books a few months ago but it's still really insightful, like Moss always seems to be. The first two essays, called National Anthems, the, Na the, the Nation Militant, and National Representation in the 1930s in Europe and the United States, discuss the ways in which nationalism chose its political accoutrements, its national anthems, its ideological art, its flags, etc. Moss says that these collectively comprise what he calls a political liturgy. According to Moss, both Italian fascism and the National Socialism with their flags, anthems, rites, and ceremonies created a civic religion which co-opted nationalist traditions. Here the civil religion of nationalism found expression through the rites and ceremonies of the fascist movements. He's deeply concerned with how these helped constitute a politics of self-representation and reinvention, and how these enabled the nation uh, to be an expression of the general popular will. Of course, the, the mobilization of political will being one of the main defining features of uh, fascist ideology. He asks really penetrating questions into why the European nationalisms of uh, the late 19th and early 20th century that are so recognizable turned out to be so different from American nationalism, which uh, Moss identifies as embodied in the image of, quote, the free-roaming, self-reliant young man, and, quote, the quintessential symbol of the new nation, cowboy heroes fighting nature, and the Indians were young, virile, courageous, but not disciplined. Images of unspoiled unspoilt nature were joined to individual courage and daring. Moss historically locates many of the precedents for fascism and nationalism in the French Revolution, which he says is one of the first instances in which there is a concept of the general will and of the people worshipping themselves. The tie that links all these phenomena is the nationalization and 
as I said, mobilization of the political masses. Uh, he says, the creation of a political liturgy based upon the aesthetics of politics was a consequence of the belief in the artificial construct of the people. They had to be mobilized, shaped, and disciplined, and the way in which this was done was influenced, if not directly determined, by the French Revolution. The revolution signaled the break between the old politics of dynasty and privilege and the new democratic politics supposedly based on the will of the people. While most nationalisms hearkened back to a volkish past ensconced in an immutable mythology of national or racial purity, Moss's essay called The Political Culture of Futurism looks at how this artistic and literary movement embraced modernity instead of eschewing it. He says, this nationalism then was not weighed down by volkish ideals. It accepted technology uh, with a new speed of time using the forces unleashed by modernity in order to integrate men and nations. The political culture of futurism was expressed through a political style that sought to propel nationalism into modernity to give it clarity and form without restraint without restraining its dynamic drive. Um, for those unfamiliar with um, with futurism or its uh, aesthetic or political uh, ideologies and ideals, ideals uh, you can look to the people of like um, people like Marinetti or uh, uh, Boccioni, who the, the the famous sculptor. Both of these were famous futurists who thought that. Uh, fascism should be more than just looking toward the past and and trying to recover a past but should also embrace the future and technology and speed and in fact they got really obsessed with those ideas another essay um, called book burning and the betrayal of the intellectuals considers the May 10th 1933 book burnings that occurred in dozens of German university towns and asks the question, how did it come to this? Why did middle class intellectuals, or as the Germans say, uh, Bildungsburger, why did they burn their own books? Uh, Moss says that the book burnings must be understood as a fire of purification, of awakening, as analogies of the generation of 1914 made clear again and again. Successful mass movements cannot be inspired by negative symbols. The book burnings were, a, were to represent a positive symbolic action within the bounds of the Third Reich. And for Moss, the betrayal of the intellectuals resulted from a turning inward, the ideal of rebirth and of purification, a craving for eternal values, for being at one with the people the primary importance of respectability and the inclusion and isolation of the outsider. Excuse me, exclusion and isolation of the outsider. The last five essays consider the ways in which Jews dealt with European nationalism after the Napoleonic emancipation, and especially the ways in which Jews carved out a middle path between what Moss calls uh, Bildung and respectability. Bildung being the word that Germans used to comprise uh, culture, but they also sort of mean it to use civilization. Uh, Bildung, uh, in, a note on that, Bildung, at least as far as the philosopher Humboldt put it in the early 19th century, was a philosophical and educational cultivation of the self sustained through cultural maturation while respectability was almost a foregone conclusion for those Jews who wanted to be assimilated into the European mainstream and middle classes. Uh, these two pursuits might not seem necessarily contradictory, but with the rise of bourgeois values, Moss, Moss seems to argue that they grew increasingly to be at odds with one another. Even though Jewish culture had much more in common with liberalism, uh, the pursuit of parliamentary government, for example, Moss looks at how Jews conscripted some of the same ideas such as physical strength, purity, and nobility of the spirit into their own nationalist identities. Uh, for Theodor Herzl and Martin Buber, for instance, uh, the civic religion of nationalism was not a call to battle, 
but an educational process for the individual Jew who must recapture his dignity uh, in being a human being. Uh, the last two essays look at the nationalist approaches of two important Zionist thinkers uh, named Max Nordau and Gershom Scholem. Uh, the only problem with the book, if one can call it that, and I guess it is a bit of a minor quibble, is that, um, or perhaps not so minor, each one of these book or each one of these essays, I should say, could easily be a book on its own. And I felt that each time I was starting an essay, I was really, really excited, and when I when I finished it, I was sort of disappointed that that's all that there was. I wanted a, a book on each topic. You only get sort of the barest taste, the tip of the iceberg with the essay form. Um, but together they serve as a really stupendous introduction to nationalism as a set of ideas in the 19th and early 20th centuries, and how Jews reacted to adopted and used those nationalist ideals in various approaches to Zionist thought. A, a really impressive collection by George L. Moss, Confronting the Nation, Jewish and Western Nationalism.